everyone, and welcome to Black Nouveau. I'm Earl Larms, and this is our October edition. This month's program starts our 30th season of providing news, information, and entertainment by and about African American communities in Southeast Wisconsin, the United States, and around the world. Later on the program, we'll revisit some of our most popular segments, and Alexandria Mack will talk with the original creators and producers of Black Nouveau. But first, James Causey discusses teaching African-American history with Dr. Robert Smith, author of Black Liberation, From Reconstruction to Black Lives Matter. And speaking of African-American history, Milwaukee's Bronzeville District is undergoing a renaissance of new businesses working to uphold the neighborhood's legacy of being a hub for black arts, culture, and commerce. Alexandria Mack speaks to some of the people leading the change and the hope for Bronzeville today. Bronzeville historically has been the playground for uh, Milwaukee and his Milwaukee black um, community. Um, so having the opportunity to have that renaissance being led by um, black um, um, leaders is, is very powerful in itself. Um, so I think folks have identified this as an opportunity to opportunity to come in and be a, a have a high significant high and significant presence in our community um, in a way that kind of connects us to our past. Bronzeville has long been considered the jewel of Milwaukee's black community. And there are new faces working to keep that jewel polished and shining bright. So a lot of folks, um, you know, this is very symbolic for them as it relates to the former use of a department store. Um, so this floor was, you know, where you would have tons and tons of uh, different aisles kind of set up for people to kind of browse through, you know, kids running around on Saturdays. This $100 million development is breathing new life into a Bronzeville building with bones almost 115 years old. We're currently sitting um, in the former Gimbel's Schuster's uh, department store um, on Historic King Drive in Milwaukee. Um, this will be the home for the Thrive On Collaboration, which is a partnership between uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin, the Great Milwaukee Foundation, and Royal Capital. All these kind of things that kind of relate back to the historic nature of this build uh, will be maintained and hopefully we can kind of play off of it in themes that kind of, you know, bridge the, the past to the present and future. For Kevin Newell and the Royal Capital Group, transforming this former department store turned warehouse is a tall task, but their focus on housing, health, and opportunity would make this a community mainstay. It's going to be a very multifaceted development opportunity um, and community impact is going to be, you know, our, our North Star. Um, so the development will be layered with affordable housing. So we have roughly 90 units of affordable housing and mixed income housing um, that will be targeted to both families and senior housing. Uh, we also have um, the Centers Institutes um, that are anchored um, via the Medical College of Wisconsin. And those, you know, social, those uh, anchor institutions, um, they focus on the social determinants of health and they're very front facing to the community. And so being able to gather them together under one roof is going to be very significant. You know, this has been a 400,000 square foot underutilized asset in the community. So being able to now incorporate the certain level of services and opportunities that we're talking about and revitalize this block, um, is going to have significant impact uh, for many generations to come. And just around the corner, the founders of the Bronzeville Collective are noticing a rise in businesses in the area. The block is full. When we first moved on this block, all of the spaces on this, uh, the storefronts on this block were empty. They have now filled in, um, and we're seeing some of them filling in around the corner on King Drive as well. Um, I do anticipate that with the Bucks winning, that it'll definitely continue to fill out in this area since we're so very close to downtown. The Bronzeville Collective is a collaborative storefront that houses 25 to 30 black, brown, queer or ally owned businesses. Tamira White is one of the founders and is the owner of Distinctive Designs. I think we add a very unique piece to the neighborhood. Um, we are all, everything in here is handmade by local artists, which may make us a little different from other boutiques and or stores in the neighborhood. Um, not in a bad way, but we give in different artists exposure. So that makes us just a tad bit different and the excitement bustling through the neighborhood is reminiscent of an earlier time. 
The renaissance in Brownsville that's growing right now is beautiful. So we see all of these new spaces popping up uh, shop-wise, ourselves included. We see the murals coming up, um, visual art is growing here. Um, there's more music and nightlife growing along the corridor of MLK. And it's just hearkening back to the old days and we're excited to get back to that. We're excited to build upon the legacy that our ancestors and the people that came before us in this neighborhood um, set out for us. So I'm excited for the Renaissance of Brownsville. Over the past year, there has been a lot of discussion on how to discuss race in the classroom. A new book, Black Liberation, From Reconstruction to Black Lives Matter by Marquette University history professor, Dr. Robert Smith, offers a way for the reader to interpret evidence and use analysis to have constructive dialogue. He joins us now. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the book with you, Brother Cosby. Man, this is a deep book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell me what you were trying to accomplish in the book. You, you know, it's a, it's a teaching instrument. Uh, and it's, it's designed to engage one fundamental question, which is, was there a breakthrough in civil rights in the 1960s? If so, how do we measure that? What is the documentary evidence to suggest that? Uh, if there was not, what documentary evidence do we use to make that determination? It really calls upon the student to use those resources to make some sort of educated uh, argument about whether or not there was a breakthrough. The, the book actually is part of a very rich series by Oxford University Press where we go through eras and moments in U.S. history and we make these very important debate-driven arguments for students to figure out. You know, give students the opportunity to really think through the history but also think, think through the materials that we use to come to these histor uh, historical arguments. It's, it's intended for early uh, intro level history courses at the college level and we also are encouraging in very significant ways for high school teachers to think about adopting it as well. So it's interesting that you mentioned debate because there is ways to debate. How is that different than standardized teaching of history? Well, what we don't want to do is just dump a bunch of information into a student's brain and then ask them to regurgitate that. That's not learning. Uh, we also want to make sure the students understand that history is far more complex than names, dates, and places. It's a, it's a much richer a much more engaging discipline than that. And so as we see students move through high school, move into college, we want to also encourage them to think more sophisticatedly about the past. This sounds crazy to some folks, but the past changes. The more we learn about the past, the more we have a better understanding of, of not only what happened then, but where we are in the present, and then where we're headed as well. And we need young voices to begin interpreting that past as well. You know, one thing that's pretty interesting is like 10 years ago, the New York Times determined that American history is students' worst subjects, mm. is, is the worst subject. Yeah. Is that still true today, and if so, why? Well, n not after the last couple of years, you know. And at any given moment as a historian, we, we can always find very exciting, rich stuff to talk about. But over the last several years, uh, we, you know, we found that Students are engaging more and more with difficult topics. They want to engage with complicated topics, and we need to make sure we're creating the space and the opportunity and the learning environment for those challenging and difficult topics to have a place where we can have a civil discourse. You know, as, as you know well, there aren't many places in our society where we can have civil discourse anymore. The classroom is one of those hallowed spaces, and we have to make sure we do our due diligence to keep it that way. That's where we can talk about this stuff. One thing that I found interesting is uh, the chapter on civil rights in the 1960s. Uh, you asked a question if, if there was a breakthrough in civil yeah. rights. I'm, I'm going to turn it to you. Was there a breakthrough? Well, if I answered that question, I wouldn't be doing the, the job that the book is trying to get us to do, which is, uh, and, I, and let me back up a little bit, so I provide a bit of a summary. There's not a lot of commentary in the book for me. I, I provide a synthesis of a lot of scholarship, and then I provide a point and a counterpoint. Yes, there was a breakthrough in some of the arguments that have been made around that. And then, no, there wasn't a breakthrough. There's been, indeed, ongoing, longstanding, uh, if you will, permanent kinds of racial uh, inequities that are going to always be with us. And the question for students to consider is where they sit on that, that fundamental notion of whether or not there was a breakthrough. Now, if I were to answer that question, I'd say we see a little bit of progress, and then we see, obviously, backlash and retrenchment. And that is a, a standard narrative, not only for movements for racial equality, but broader 
social movements uh, in, in general. Um, but we have to ask the question. And that's what's really important. So uh, I, what I really liked is the uh, Clinton crime bill. Mm. You, you, you get into discussion about that. Yeah. Now, when I think about the Clinton cr crime bill, I think about you know prisons, and, and I also think about the number of officers that were added. Sure. But there's so much more to that bill. Can you talk about that? And did that help African Americans? Uh, you know, <clears throat> this is where the fundamental question of what happens after the 1960s is critical. If we look at policing and incarceration, we know the racial disparities. We know the realities with officer-involved shootings. We know all of that. This is part of a very important conversation about long-standing policing, surveillance, and state violence. And that crime bill sets in motion a whole range of processes that give life to those issues that erupted into significant uh, demonstrations and opposition last summer. And so that, that particular crime bill is exhaustive. It includes far more than we could ever imagine. Um, and it is also an important conversation of what the Democrats in particular, uh, what role they've played in this conversation of racial equality or inequality as we see ourselves as a nation so polarized along those political lines. Okay, we're, we're in this conversation here. We didn't get to discuss critical race theory in depth. We'll do that online at milwaukeepbs.org. Join us there. Hello and welcome to a special edition and a special season of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Colas. We're glad you could join us. Hello, I'm Joanne Williams. Welcome to a new season of Black Nouveau in our new home. That was a look back at the many faces that have graced the Black Nouveau team over the years. Now we sit down with the show's creators, Sharon Patterson, Joe Savage, and Liddy Collins. Thank you all for joining. I feel like this is a mini family reunion. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> I guess. Very excited to have you all here. Um, so my first question to you all is what inspired Black Nouveau? Well, it was a sign to me, mm -hmm. we need a black show. So um, what do we do? You know, I sort of looked around. We had done talk show, talk show, mm -hmm. talk show. I said, Let, let's do something a little positive. So I, I wanted to get everybody, every black person working here at the time involved. But um, Glenn dropped out. What's Glenn's last name? Riley. Riley. He mm -hmm. dropped out, but I was trying to include all of the people here, you know. It would have been cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we, got, we got together several times, and we tried to do things from a black perspective, mm -hmm. but positive black perspective. Positive black. Mm -hmm. Because uh -huh. there were other shows before this was uh, Thinking yeah. Ebony yeah. Necromancers. and Necromancers. Mm -hmm. This Is It, uh, yep. Ray Moore. Did. But Joe put the gauntlet out because he wanted it to be just great to be as good as national shows. And it's like we all went in with the hand and said, we're gonna do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and being positive was the key. Um, for the community or outside of our community, the only thing that people knew about African Americans for the most part was what they said on the 10 o'clock news. And there was so much more to us than that. And so Joe said, if nothing else is going to be a positive show, we'll tackle the issues but we're doing, how are they overcoming them? You know, what's, what's the outcome after this, you know, something has happened, et cetera, not just the negative of what you saw. So when you were pitching it to like the administration or anyone who was like in charge, was like everyone consistently, consistently rooting um, for Black Nouveau, was it pretty easy getting it um, green lighted? No, <laughs> it was just the opposite. Uh, see, uh, we, at the time, we had a new general manager and he was, he had a perspective, a black perspective, and he wanted me to present his side. And I said, well, I've been black longer than you have. I think I'll present my side. How about that? And we fought all the time. But, uh, you know, after a while, he bowed out. As a matter of fact, he lost his job. So it, was, it became a lot easier then to do what we wanted to do. 
can y'all talk about how long each of you were involved with Black and Nouveau? Uh, well, all of us started it in 1988. Uh, Joe, you retired first. Yeah, I, I retired in 96. I was the first to go. Yeah. But I was the oldest. So, <laughs> <laughs> You, you, earned your, you earned your yeah. time. <laughs> well, yeah, I had, I had been in uh, television for 12 and a half years before I came here. So I, I stayed here 22 years. So I thought, I think I'm ready to retire. <laughs> you know? well, and that's what happened. And, and then I was the next to go. I left in 2006. So from 88 to 2006, I was here. Uh, well, I was here longer than that, cause, but from the show. <laughs> um, and I took another position at one of our local colleges. And I'm the one who retired last two years ago. <laughs> and I had fun doing it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the I was the one. things we did, oh my goodness. Oh, wow. <laughs> and see, people kept, they would tell me when we were, you know, we were always doing other shows, but whenever we're traveling, doing other shows, I would always do a new Vogue piece. And the people would always say, keep telling our story. Mm -hmm. And that's what just, it's that drive was here because people wanted us to tell our stories. Nouveau was really oh. a connector mm -hmm. of community. So even though we said um, we're, we're taping this for our community to tell our stories, there were people outside our community who finally went, oh wow. I got a letter from um, a woman once who identified herself as being white who lived up north. And she said prior to watching Nouveau, I thought all black people were gangbangers and teen moms and you know murderers or whatever. She said, now I see you're just like us. You love your kids, you want the best for them, you're doctors and, and you're entrepreneurs and you know, you're <laughs> educators. It, it was like she had no idea mm. because her reference was the 10 o'clock news. And so Nouveau, it, it just encapsulated so much of who we are, what we are and what we have to offer that the world just, I think, um, our, in our sphere of influence, um, we really changed some things. And there was a brief moment when Black Nouveau did go off the air. Can you all talk about how, like, what happened where it disappeared, but also what brought it back? The community brought it back. Mm -hmm. Our community stood up and said, we want this program. I, I think um, when you get new people to join the station, they come with their own set of ideas. And the person who came in as GM then thought, why are we having all of these individual local shows? Let's put one show together and we'll call it, was it Milwaukee Tonight, Tonight or something yeah, like that? Yeah. And we were all supposed to you know, contribute to it. And it was an okay show, but it, it wasn't what our audience wanted. And so we were off for what, four years, I think it was? I think it was five years. Was it five, it five years? And the community just kept saying, where's the show? Where's the show? And it got to, I think, a, a, a certain amount of time where the pitch was so hot about where's the show that they said, you know, maybe we should bring it back. And we came back. How do you hope that the show continues to evolve over the years? Keep telling well, that's up to you. Just keep telling the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's up there to you. Lots put your, put your heart and soul told. into it, and something good will come of it, mm -hmm. I hope. <laughs> but it has to be, I, I think, for, in, in my opinion, a great mix. So you can't just, I don't think you should do just all serious things or you should do all fluff pieces or, you know, I think it has to be a mix. When we started, we said it was a magazine show and like mm -hmm. a magazine, every time you turn the page, there's something different that's in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what has to, that will sustain the program. If one moment you can say, oh, wow. And the next one you can go, oh, <laughs> did you see that? Oh, you know, mm -hmm. I think it has to continually to, to engage and entertain mm -hmm. and, just be all that it can be. Mm -hmm. and, and involve the people out there. You mm -hmm. can meet some friends out there who you have no idea uh, how thoughtful they can be, you know, and they can help you a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. Just get involved with your community. The community will give you the stories. Mm -hmm. They will give you them. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for joining us. It's been a privilege to celebrate this 30th season with you all here with us. Thank you so much you. for having us. It was a blast talking about the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
That's a clip from This Little Light of Mine, the stories of Marianne Anderson and Leontine Price. The Black Nouveau staff produced it 10 years ago. It won an Emmy for its star and creator, Adrian Dandridge. Other performance specials featured the Kothi Dance Company, and the annual MLK concert with the Bel Canto Chorus and the choirs of the Holy Redeemer Church of God in Christ. We've produced specials on the fight for open housing. That bridge is forever. I mean, when you step on that bridge, and the further you get across that bridge, and you know what's waiting on you, it gets more, more, and more tense, okay? When we got to the end of the bridge on the south end, we were met by this angry, angry group of people. I mean, they were calling us all kinds of things. Um, the, the, the police officers were standing ready, but I didn't understand who they were ready for. Remembering the 1963 March on Washington. When we got to Virginia and saw all of those buses with all of the, as Dr. King would say, all the God children going to Washington. But one thing they're saying, Jim Crow, you dead. Between 1842 and the Civil War, more than 100 slaves were helped to freedom by Wisconsinites. We also went tripping to show you places of interest in Wisconsin you might want to visit with your family. African Americans played a major role in the history of American railroads. This Pullman sleeper at the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay is an example of the kind of luxury Pullman wanted. It has 10 of the original Pullman berth accommodations. It has a bedroom and it has uh, two compartments. It is part of an exhibit, Pullman Porters from Service to Civil Rights. We went with Milwaukeeans to the second Million Man March. America is under divine judgment as we speak. We've seen events firsthand of how justice is not being served for the black community. So we decided that we needed to be here and stay in solidarity with men, women, children of all ethnic backgrounds, and especially uh, blacks who are in support of making sure that justice is being served and being realized or else. We visited New Orleans with the Running Rebels community organization to clean up after Katrina. Before Katrina, they didn't have these trailers. See these trailer homes here? We didn't have them. And they had a house set every block. See this open section right here? Uh huh. It was three houses there. We've examined issues facing our community. We've all seen the images. The shooting of Jacob Blake, the protests, the subsequent violence, and even the death of some of the protesters. But what do we know about Kenosha and its citizens? especially as citizens of color, what is life like for them? Do black lives matter? Diabetes is the fourth leading cause of death among African Americans, but having the disease does not have to be a death sentence. Our guest, S.C. Patha Merkerson, is living proof. You have diabetes. When were you diagnosed and, and how did that happen? It was about 12 years ago. Uh, I was doing a health fair and uh, I got to the table uh, that was set up for a medical school. Uh, my blood sugar was taken. When you're a minority, you have all of these stresses on you. So that stress, along with being H not it maybe HIV positive or even just gay at and, and that point, can heighten all of these stresses upon you. So you're, you have all this stuff on your shoulders. So when someone isn't accepting of you and loving of you, the impact of the community and the people that are supposed to support and love you is very, very important. And that's just what we're trying to do with the project, is to show people that love is the most important thing and we should love one another for who we are unconditionally. But what we've done for the most part is to share our stories of who we are and how we contribute to society. Is there any itching or discomfort or anything? That's no problem. We can get that cleared up. 
With this antifungal preparation, apply a very thin film using a Q-tip, part the hair, apply it three times a day, shampoo it twice a week with just any cleansing shampoo. Doesn't have to be any expensive medicated, just something to keep it clean. This is Dr. Lester Carter's trademark, his personal interest in his customers and their concerns. It's the kind of medicine he administered since he opened up his pharmacy on the corner of 24th and Burleigh in 1968. Back then, the neighborhood was mostly white and German. A former co-worker of mine uh, suggested I come skiing with her one day, and I thought, you know, black people don't ski. <laughs> um, but she said, it's a lot of fun. I was in my 20s at the time. She said, well, the parties are great. You should come. And once I realized uh, that it was going to cost a little money to go, I said, well, I might as well learn how to ski. It keeps you in shape. Um, you uh, enjoy the outdoors. It gives you something to do in the winter, especially in a place like Milwaukee. I mean, you can either sit around and wait for the snow to go away, or you can do things that are enjoyable. When I was promoted to Major General in 2011, I was the first African-American woman to achieve that rank in the history of the Army, and I achieved federally recognized rank. When I was leaving Fort Knox, a group of young um, African-American female officers who worked there, um, they couldn't give me anything of real value because there's a prohibition against accepting things like that from subordinates, but they put this together and gave me this hammer um, just to signify that I, I had cr broken the glass ceiling. A daughter's relationship with her dad, you can kind of tell, it's a telltale sign of the type of man she'll end up marrying or spending the rest of her life with. This is our first official date. You know, I just want to show them some different things and uh, want to grow up right, you know, with, with some options in. And this is our, our prerequisite in showing them how they should be treated on the evening out. Before we wrap up this edition, I want to remind you to check us out on our website at milwaukeepbs.org. You'll find the web exclusive with Dr. Rob Smith, as well as other materials you just might find useful. And before we close, a bittersweet moment for us as this is the last Black Nouveau to be directed by Dr. Raul Galvan, who's retiring from Milwaukee PBS after two tours of duty and over 30 years of service. We wish you nothing but the best in whatever else you plan to do, and we thank you for your professionalism and for your humanity and all the stories about baseball. For the entire Black Nouveau team, I'm Earl Arms. Have a good night.